right? Because when we do that, we, we typically get it wrong, uh, as evidenced by that pastor who told me that we lost our child because there was a unrepentant hidden sin in my life. And, um, you know, it, it's hard because we're trying to seek some, some certainty and some clarity on how could something as tragic and awful like that happen? How could we see a, a God of the universe being good when he allows his good people? And she had just recently come to Christ and connected with us in the church and was just so full of life. Well, the reality is, is that there is injustice in this world. The will of the Father is not being done all of the time. But there are moments where his will does break into our reality and it changes things. And the promise that he makes to us is that he, like from the very beginning of time, like if you just sort of um, pause and sort of reflect, if you've ever had anybody walk you through sort of the five or six act story of the Bible. And we have a sermon series that we just did this past summer on um, thinking of the Bible as a five or six act story. What you'll see from the very beginning is that God has mounted a rescue mission. Why? Because he wants to restore his good earth. He wants to bring his justice into our reality. And that's sort of where he's going, and that's what Jesus talks about as he inaugurates the kingdom in Luke 4, is that God wants to bring that justice, but God also has an enemy who is working to prevent his will from being done in the earth. And from time to time, that enemy gets little victories. But that doesn't mean that God is not concerned about the case of those who are experiencing injustice. And I think in, in some sense, that's where we step in, um, into the gap. That when we become aware of injustice, we actually have power to do something about it. Very practically, in some cases. Uh, we had an extra room in our home. This is actually a good story on us. I suppose the bad ones that I was telling earlier. Uh, we have an extra room in our home. A friend of ours who goes to the church, uh, she got kicked out of her apartment unexpectedly because her roommate um, uh, was having a new housemate. It was called the baby. And her room was becoming the nursery. And so she had to vacate unexpectedly. And a friend of mine said, don't talk about your care for the homeless if you're not willing to open your home and bring someone in. Now, that I'm not prescribing that to anybody in the room. So if you heard that, you need to just let that fall right off of you. Don't even look at where it went. Just let it go. Okay. But it was something that hit me in, in this sort of way. It was like, oh, yeah, I, I care about the homeless. And, but I have this guest room. I'm not sure I'm ready to do that. And so this friend needed a place to live. And so as an exercise of faith for me, I said to Maria, I was like, we should have that friend move in. Now, here was the real exercise. This friend has a cat. Mm -hmm. And I hate pets. <laughs> I hate dogs, and I hate cats. And the good news is, is my wife does as well. So there will be no cats or dogs in our house. None at all. Even if you think our kids are going to prevail upon us to put pets in our house, you do not know me well enough. <laughs> it is not going to happen. They'll be at Grandma's house. <laughs> and so, um, but it was a stretch because... I really hate cats because cats are like mischievous and sneaky and they get into stuff. Like I lived with a cat and I had some banana bread that someone made for me and it was on top of the fridge. And you know what that little cat did? <laughs> the cat jumped on top of the fridge and ate through the aluminum foil to get to my banana bread. Now that would be a place at which I would need to experience some justice because I was going to... Do some things to the cat. It's, uh, it's Nancy's uh, son-in-law's cat uh, that I'm talking about. And he did another thing, because I make this great little open-faced sandwich with shrimp, and it was you know I had some fresh shrimp on the counter as I was preparing things, and I left the room, and you know what that little bugger did? He went in and ate my shrimp. I was not happy. So anyway, so it was a real big stretch for us to make space for her. I didn't make it easy for the cat because, like, you get these runners, and on the other side they have little spikes on it because they don't like tactile changes. And so I, like, armed my house in such a way that the cat would stay in her room. So I'm, I'm telling you, I, I'm committed to not having pets. And that's a weak example of me doing a little bit of justice, right? Okay. 
So, so, so G- Jesus is definitely about um, bringing about God's justice. And so that may come in the form of healing. It may come in the form of reconciliation. And, and as we move forward in that idea, I'm going to talk a little bit about resurrection and then come back to the story of Angie. So, um, so I'm now in the new creation part. So this brings us to one of the most uh, daring aspects of the Jesus path, which is the claim that Jesus died and was raised from the dead. And uh, if you're ever interested, I'd love to go out for coffee because I led a group of uh, 13 or so folks through a five-year-long study around resurrection and Jesus and uh, you know his historical context. And let me assure you, resurrection, it happened. Okay, that's the one thing I think we can be absolutely assured of, and, I, and we know the counter arguments. So if you come from a faith tradition that says the physical, literal resurrection didn't happen, but the story that we tell, which is true, is good enough, I'd love to talk about that with you, because um, I'm going to say no. Like, physical, literal resurrection occurred, okay, or the whole thing is not true, is is what I'm going to make stake my claim on and love to take you out for coffee I'll tell you some stories and we can talk about it and Jesus had this big hairy audacious audacious goal that's what your next fill in the blank is to come from Jim Collins he says you need one of these it's called a BHAG in your life a big hairy audacious goal and this was the goal to renew human life in the world as we know it and so the movement that bears the name of Jesus Christianity is rooted in the faith that his death that in his death, Jesus mysteriously took on all the powers of evil. That's what I was talking about in the sermon today, that he defeated on the cross the power of death. On the cross, he defeated the power of evil, and he created space for us to have reconciliation with him and God. And you can think of it almost in the same way, like if you're a parent and you had a little kid and you were out in the woods, I don't know why you would be there, And uh, you happen upon a poisonous snake and it bites your kid. Most parents, um, I I think I would do this for Michaela. Um, I hope I would. You would sort of try to suck the the venom out, right? You know, because you want this child to to live. And that's... You might. I'm just being honest. (laughs) Like, like I'd I'd probably have to think about it, like, to see if there was another way. (laughs) Because, you know, the, the... the first law of nature steps in and says self-preservation. And I'm like, wait, that's why they say put your mask on first instead of your kids, right? Okay, maybe maybe all of you people are much better parents than I am. Pray that Michaela never gets bit by a snake. And so you think of it as Jesus sucking the poison of death and sin and evil out of the world and taking it onto himself and allowing it, as it were, to have its way with him. But the power in this is that in this act of obedience, God does something (coughs) mysteriously. It's it's a mystery how he does it. But in that act of love brings about our reconciliation. So what we're called to do is to have faith in the resurrection of Jesus. Because if we don't believe that he was raised from the dead, then there is no hope for us because the power that raised him from the dead is the Holy Spirit, which brings life and freedom and peace into our lives. So if we deny that, then we get ourselves back to the point at which we do not have reconciliation with God. So he's calling us to have faith that he entered into a new form of life that doesn't end. It's life that continues forever. But it's a transformed life. And he also has a transformed body. See, his body, he wouldn't have to wear a Fitbit on because it's all working out, right? Yeah, okay, great. Uh, the other thing I realized to lose weight, we could just move, like, where I had to walk everywhere because that, that's, that's a great way of making it work. So you can think of this as sort of a preview of what's coming. Jesus' resurrection and his resurrected body is a preview of the promise that God is making to us. But, you know, I'm acknowledging as you should, that this is possibly difficult to to comprehend and understand. Like, what does this mean, and how do I make sense of resurrection? What's the role of resurrection? I mean, the thing for me is it gives me hope that my story isn't um, completed as it is, that that God 